All right. Good morning, church. Oh. Oh, some of you have a new habit, uh, already start a new habit, moving from your regular church. I mean, your regular chair, not church. <laughs> so I'm a bit confused here. All right. Good morning. Happy New Year, church. All right. It's a good year. Amen. All right. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Let's get our Bible ready. I want to jump in because we have a lot to cover. And we are going to start with the new theme of 2023. I want you to know that uh, the pastoral team, we are so excited, but at the same time, we are overwhelmed. We are nervous because, you know, um, we have uh, on our hands uh, such a huge material, such a huge word. And I want to, my prayer, our prayer is that we're going to grow together into the word as we walk together into this year. Amen. So this morning, I want to share with you a message that I titled, Stand Firm and Take Action. All right? Stand Firm and Take Action. Can we all say it together? One, two, three. Stand Firm and Take Action. All right. So I'm going to talk uh, from uh, from Daniel chapter 11. So I want to encourage you, whatever translation that you are most comfortable, um, as long as it's uh, sanctioned by the church, (laughs) not your own version, Please stick on Daniel 11, and we're going to learn this throughout the whole year. And also, we're going to begin throughout this sermon. We're going to begin with Daniel 11, and, but I want to jump into our anchor uh, verse immediately, and then I'm going to go back and forth into the whole chapter, all right? So get your note ready, and uh, this is also recorded if you want to watch again, and it will be streamed as well. It's live stream at... At, at, at the same time, right now as I'm speaking. So Daniel 11, verse 32. Let me begin with this word. Daniel 11, verse 32. I'm reading from the ESV version. It says, He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action, all right? So I, wanna, I want to um, share this with you again, um, that our theme and vision throughout 2023 will be stand firm and take action, all right? Stand firm and take action. So um, it's always a challenge. Next slide, please. It's always a challenge for our church, especially in Boston, because uh, every church get to introduce their vision and theme uh, at like the first uh, service, But in Boston, uh, a lot of us are gone and won't be back until like the second or third and even last week of January. So we are going to go through this uh, periodically and we're going to go back to this from time to time. And we want uh, not just this to be a slogan and a motto, but uh, for us, the pastoral, there's a great challenge ahead of us to really live out the word of God. And I do believe, we do believe that we live in such a time that such a strong word is really necessary, all right? So our prayer is that this church will rise up, every single one of you, and we will stand firm and take action. I mean, as a church, as a living church of God, we are not at the back row and subject of everything, but we are supposed to be the trendsetter. We are supposed to be the history maker, not just part of history or just observing history, but we are to be history maker. So let me begin by saying this expression that we have uh, often uh, heard. I'm sure you've heard this expression and say it from time to time, that timing is everything, all right? Timing is everything. Um, You need this. You need to understand this concept in everything in life. Um, In music, you need to keep a beat. Therefore, timing is everything. Um, especially when you're playing in a band, more than one people or one musical instrument is involved. I mean, you can't just uh, keep your own beat and then other people, you know, uh, have their own pace. Timing is everything. It's only, it's only become a good music if everyone keep on the same beat, right? In sports, you know, uh, take baseball, for example. It, uh, timing is everything. I mean, for if you are a hitter, you know, you, you got to time your swing just right about the time that the axis of the ball are launching toward you. Same thing with pitching. 
Uh, even in a simple thing like jokes, you know, I mean, timing is everything, you know, to, to tell a good jokes, you know, you need a good timing, all right? Otherwise, it's going to be, you cannot be telling jokes in a, in a, in a funeral home or something, you know, it, it will be, it will be, <laughs> it will be bad. In investment in economy, you know, I don't need to be lecturing you. you, many of you are more expert than me when it comes to investment, but it involves good timing, you know, they say, you know, buy low, sell high. So therefore, finding the right timing is all the more important in every aspect of our life. And that is exactly what the book that we are going to go through together is all about. The book of Daniel, it's about timing. The book of Daniel is about timing. And especially in this closing chapter, which is chapter 11 and 12, you're going to find that Daniel talks about the end times. right? So this is a subject that I think is something that every Bible believer, every believer of the Lord need to visit often, we need to learn, become a student of it, because uh, whether you realize it or not, we're right smack dab in the middle of it. Uh, we are right now, uh, um, sometimes there are books in the Bible that when you read, you're actually reading history, but uh, let's not forget that some part of it is being relived again in our time, and there are those that that, that is not yet materialized. So I want you to be mindful of this, and I want you to really become a student of this. I want New England City Blessing Church to really dig deep on the word of the book of Daniel, because this is a book about timing, and it's about specifically end times. And uh, it, I think it is fitting to us. I mean, the analogy, the symbolism, it fits hands to glove. You know, Daniel being in a, uh, being an exile in one of the most modern city, you know, and the most secular and progressive culture, which is Babylonia, which is the same with us right now. We are, uh, the Bible teaches us that this world is not our home. That makes us an exile, all right? Our true home is not here, but we are going there. Someday we will be there. But right here, right now, as we are in exile, just like God spoke to Isaiah and Jeremiah, uh, uh, they need to be fruitful in their exile. You know, there were those false prophets who prophesied to them that, you know what, don't unpack your back yet. God will deliver us from Babylon. And Jeremiah says, you are all false prophets because this exile is God's design. And even in this exile, he wants you to trade. He wants you to plan. He wants you to live. So as much as this world is not our home, but God commanded us to be fruitful, to be living, and to, to, to make better. Jeremiah says, uh, uh, bless the city that I, am, that, I, that I exile you, because its welfare will be your welfare. All right? So Daniel is a book about timing, and in particularly the book of end times. All right? So I want to go this simple aspect to you. So that we can understand the word better, all right? So there are keys to understanding the word. The first key to understanding the word, especially the book of Daniel in the chapter 11 that we are going to understand, is that number one, it is to be understood as a history, you know, all right? So it is actually reporting to us what happens throughout the, the, the day of the writer. Daniel, the book of Daniel is, if you split in the middle, is interesting. The first six chapter. It speaks about personal narrative, um, his own, Daniel's own recollection of serving three kings, you know, uh, and, and the first six chapters is about his personal journey. But then again, the last six chapters, chapter 7 to 12, is actually the book of prophecies, all right? So it is the book of prophecies. So what is interesting is that this book is what is known as, by many scholars, the most specifically fulfilled predictive passages in the entire scripture. You know, it predicts history over the span of 375 years in very excellent detail. It is undisputed, the most, the most fulfilled predictive passages in the scripture. Isn't that something? You know, it predicts history over 375 years of span, of period. And, and even those who does not believe in God, atheists, you know, cannot dispute this, and those uh, uh, unbelievers and uh, 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 unbelief scholars, their only retort to this fact is that they can only say, oh, you know, this was written after all the facts were done. 
while we all know that this was written hundreds and hundreds of years ago by the prophecies that was given, by the vision that was given to Daniel. And it gives a very clear, specific fulfillment of things that are to happen over the span of 375 years. You know, uh, if you will look, uh, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but I'm just going to give you some key points. And I think this is important because you're going to read Daniel 11. Imagine, uh, imagine a, 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 what do you call, uh, a desert, if you will. So you're walking through all the desert. You're walking through all the desert. And then in the middle of the desert, suddenly you found an oasis of water. So that's what verse 32 feels like. I mean, throughout, uh, it's 45 verses in Daniel 11, and you're going to read conflicts, warring nations, kings rise up, kings fall, deception, truths, and then all of a sudden in the middle, but the people who know their God shall stand strong and take action, shall stand firm and take action. Now, this is certainly a very refreshing oasis in the middle of deserts of prophecies and details that are boring. Uh, at least if you don't understand the significance of it, it will be boring and you can easily get lost in the desert. But without all these details and history, verse 32 won't matter much because the context is in the pudding, in the whole pudding. It's in the whole passage. So I want to encourage you, you know, uh, um, uh, don't, don't, don't skip this passage because this is important. So this is a book that is to be understood, some historical facts that was reported, but it is also a book of prophecies. And uh, just for example, if you go to Daniel 11, verse 2, this was when the, the angel began to reveal to Daniel. The angel says, And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three kings shall rise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. You know, the angel... Uh, uh, give Daniel a very specific revelation as to how many kings will rise. And the last will be stronger and richer than, than the other. And that is none other than Xerxes the, of the antiquity, which was in our Bible, it was recorded in the book of Esther, which is King Ahasuerus. And then it says, uh, when he has become strong enough through the, his riches, he shall stir up against the kingdom of Greece. So you will see between this chapter, only two kingdoms are featured here, Persian and Greece, because these are the two kingdoms that has been giving the Israelites, the people of the Lord, the hard time throughout uh, the most in throughout history. And then verse 3, then a mighty king shall arise, the mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven. This is none other than the Alexander the Great of Macedonia, you know, the son of Philip of the Macedon. And Alexander the Great, it's amazing how the angel revealed down to the very detail. It says in verse 4, as soon as his kingdom as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity. So what it is saying is that this king will rise, will be the strongest, will be the greatest, but then again, it won't last long because he will die and his kingdom will be broken into four different kingdoms, but not to his descendants. Why? Because Alexander died young. Alexander the Great apparently didn't die great because at the age of 32, after a drunk stopper party, he died. And he died without having any heir. And as a result, the whole kingdom was in shambles and it ended up being passed down to all of his four generals, four different, uh, 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 four winds of heaven, four north, south, east, west. But of all these four generals, which is Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, only two of his generals that was featured in these passages. So throughout the passage on first 6 to 21, you're going to actually listen to the story of interchange between the king of the south and the king of the north which is Ptolemy and Seleucus. And this is what lead us to verse 32. So Ptolemy become the king of the south, which is Egypt. And then um, Seleucus become the king of the north, which is uh, Syria. So Syria on the north, Egypt on the south. Guess who's in the middle between north and south? Israel. <laughs> so their whole life, 
The people of the Lord has been always under oppression. We have that fitting uh, word in, in Indonesia. Uh, uh, when the elephants fight among each other, guess who died? <laughs> you know? So that's what happened. So even at the beginning, the people, the chosen people of God, never rose to prominence and destiny without opposition. So if you say timing is everything, it's all about timing, and the book of Daniel is a book of end times, you've got to understand that it was not any easier then, and it was not any easier now. So we don't get to be uh, uh, um, self-pity on all the challenges that we have now. We don't get to feel, oh, you know what, it's different with us now. Oh, it's a lot more difficult. You have got to understand, since the beginning, the trajectory of God's promise and destiny has never been without opposition. So in case you are discouraged at the prospect of your life right now, at the enemy that you are seeing right now, guess what? Nothing changes. It has been like that since the beginning. So if you are going to make it, if you're going to be successful, if you're going to be triumphant, Guess what? It's not going to be through a plastic of carpet that you're going to walk on without any opposition or any, any, any difficulty. Because in the beginning, there's always opposition. Even since at the day of the Garden of Eden, in the beginning, there's always fierce opposition. So take heart, church. So this is what happened. So one of the descendants of the king of the north which is Seleucus, ended up becoming the main feature that lead us to verse 32 here. So in verse 32, uh, you will hear the first portion says, he seduces them with flattery. I'm going to go back to that again, and I'm gonna, we go, throughout this series, we're going to study more on the, the significance of the role of this he. All right? But this, the key to understanding this is that it's a book of history, that is so awesome, down to the very detail, 375 years. But it's also a word book of prophecy. Now, when it comes to prophecy, you got to understand prophecy, there's a short-term prophecy which was fulfilled in the story of the rising of the king of the north and the south and their descendant. The descendant of king uh, Seleucus, which is the king of the north, which is, uh, it's called Antiochus IV, is actually fulfilled in the lifetime of, uh, of, of, this, of this verse, of Daniel. But then again, there is also what is called long-term prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled. And it will probably be fulfilled in our time or even beyond our time. But the key here is that this is the blueprint of the trajectory of time that we need to be looking at because there's a good chance that what we are going to go through is going to be prescribed right here. So church... This is something that is important for us to go back. It is giving us the end times prophecies, namely the Antichrist. Antiochus IV, which is, he called himself Antiochus Epiphanes, which is means, uh, Epiphanes means illustrious, because he named himself such a way because he considered himself God. So he was saying, in other words, he's saying, I am Antiochus the illustrious, the glorious. So he equated himself with God. So we all know, if you read through in Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, you will find that the understanding of Antiochus becomes enlarged in this book of prophecy. And when you read it, you understand that this is actually a representation of something bigger. Antiochus is just the prefigure, but Antichrist is the main feature. So it is actually warning not just Daniel and the people in his time, his contemporaries, but it is also warning us as a church who are reading thousands of years later that there will come some, somebody who is going to equate himself in the place of God. And he's going to try to seduce the people of the covenant. But the people who know their God shall stand strong and take action. Shall stand firm and take action. Amen, church? So that's how we understand. So... We are living in the end times. Hello, hello. We're living in the end times. I, I think, I think uh, um, the church has been 
in, in, in I don't know, sleep, in slumber or drunken stupor. Uh, we have been in denial all these times because we thought, oh, the economy is good. Or maybe, you know, at some point it was good. And, and maybe you were saying, oh, my life is good. So it couldn't be the end times. But let me tell you something. Everything will happen conditioned to the word of God, not conditioned to what your make-believe will say. So it is, I mean, the Bible gives us a sign, physical and spiritual signs of what is to be the end times. I don't have the whole time to read this, but you can take note, Matthew 24, verse 3 to 14, 2 Timothy 4, 3, 4, 2 Timothy 3, 12, 13. You know, it's, it's, it's giving you the signs. In Matthew 24, the disciple asked Jesus, Teacher, what is to be the signs of the end times? And Jesus, you know, spilled it out right there. Just read it yourself. Uh, Nations will rise against nations. Earthquakes, famines, even pandemic is there. Don't take my word for it. Just read it yourself. Paul, the father, gave his son Timothy this warning. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 to 13. Indeed, all who desire to live godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Bad to worse. Does that remind you of what we're seeing today? Evil people will go from bad to worse. And it's nothing new. In the Bible, thousands of years ago, it's already been written. We'd be a fool not to look at this book and, you know, Proverbs says, you know, the prudent look at danger and avoid. But the inexperienced keep on walking and get into challenge, get into trouble, get into calamity. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 to 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. So instead of trying to be taught, Learning and, and trying to get teaching, they want their feelings to be validated. Even at whatever cost on whoever is saying it. The first person who agree with what he wants to live his life, how she wants to live his, her life, will get her ears or her heart or his heart. So, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And we'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myth. Okay, so physical and spiritual, it's very possible that we're living in the end of end times. I hope by saying this, it will make you think of how you live your life. Because you keep burning the candle from both ends, pretty soon you're going to run out. Well, maybe some of you are saying, wow, what a bad sermon to be starting the year. No, this is good news. This is good. If you are reminded that there are problems ahead of you, that's good news. All right? If you are being awakened while danger is lurking, that's good news. That's good news. Unless you don't like to be helped, then that's another story. Maybe you're a sadomasochist. You like to have a, you know, you like to torture yourself, then that's a different story. But God is trying to warn you. Wake up, people of the Lord. Things will not be that much different now in modern exile than it was then in Babylonian exile. The shape, the face, the name might be different, but it's still the same old opposition because you are still the same old people of God living under the same old covenant, worshiping the same living God. Amen? So Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, the first portion says, He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. Remember that four generals, only two were becoming prominent. Ptolemy on the north, Seleucus on the south. Ptolemy ended up working with Rome so that he can defeat Seleucus. And Seleucus, upon being defeated, got so sore when he got back to, to, to Jerusalem. He started, you know, uh, uh, torturing. He started persecuting Israelites. And, and it was marked in the book of, in, in the book of uh, uh, Daniel, in, in the history of the Jews, as the, what's called the abomination of the desolation. Because he stopped 
the sacrifice on the temple that has been going on for years and years. Even Alexander the Great did not have the nerve to stop that sacrifice, to stop Judaism. But this evil kingdom who call himself as the God, stop it. And not only that, he desecrated the temple. He put the image and the statue of Zeus and put it into the temple of God. He slaughtered a pig on the altar and smeared all the blood everywhere, which is we all know pig is the, you know, uh, uh, the most uh, filthy animals uh, spiritually and, 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 and uh, physically in that regard, in that year, uh, in that era. Not only that, there was a recollection written by the Jewish historian Josephus that he captured the, the priests and forced them to eat that pig. And that time, 80,000 Jews perished and 40,000 were imprisoned. So many were being hunted down. So nothing new. If you, just like what, what it says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Paul said it to Timothy in the New Testament era, but this has been going on since the Old Testament, since the book of Daniel. And maybe you're saying, well, not in our time. Maybe because you're living in a cocoon in America. Because in some other part of the country, that's the reality. If you go to Indonesia and some other part, I've received report. If you go to China, if you go to Africa, that's what's going on. You know, I'm not praying that it will come soon to a theater near you. But for as long as you intend to worship God, there will always be an opposition to persecute you. So what happened was this king rises up, Antiochus the fourth. And he even pressured the Jews. And when it was said in verse 32, he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. What it means was that he pressed the people of the Lord, the believer of the covenant, to the point that some of them ended up leaving their faith so that they can be saved. They were seduced. So now up to this point, it's, it's a 375-year history in a nutshell, in 20 minutes. Comes the second portion of Daniel 11:32, And it says, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Can, can you click next slide? The people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. So I hope now you can get a better context on this oasis in the middle of a desert. I hope the meanings become enriched because you understand this is a powerful word. And as much as this was a report of history, this is also a prophecy for us. This is also good in our time. Because if you're living in this exile in 2023, wherever you are right now, you are going to go through this. And my prayer is that you're going to take this and you're going to run with it. And despite all the pressure, all the pressure to, 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 to be subdued, all the pressure to compromise, all the pressure to give in, instead you will rise up. You will learn to know your God so that you can stand firm and take action. You know, I was reminded in the word, another word that Paul gave to his spiritual son Timothy, which is, I think, is, is a very good word to how we can respond to this word. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. My prayer is that you're going to hear, you know, there are those who will listen to this word this morning and, and, and go home Losing your joy. <laughs> oh, I wish I didn't come to church this morning. But there are those who will listen to this and be excited, be encouraged, because God did not give us spirit of fear. In other translations, it says, God did not give us the spirit of fear that makes us timid. Timid, it means, you know, losing your flexibility and agility and your power to make move. God did not give you that spirit, but instead he gave you the spirit of strength, power, love, and sound mind, wisdom. In other translations, self-control. Self-control. Hello? 
So whether or not you're going to be discouraged or fearful today is a choice. It is something that you can control by choosing to believe in the word of God. That's how we drive out fear. Is when we decided from this day forward, I will choose to believe in the word of God rather than entertaining my fear. Rather than giving platform. Rather than giving audience. Rather than giving, uh, you know, anybody know Super, Super Bowl? You know Super Bowl is the most expensive airtime for an ad, right? I think the last time I heard like, what, 10 seconds, like couple millions. Do you know that your mind is more expensive than that, than even 30 seconds slot on Super Bowl? Every time that gets aired to your mind has a power of not just influencing you, but influencing the people, the life around you. It is more expensive than a 30 second slot on Super Bowl. It's your mind. Don't air it out. Don't give it a precious airtime. Don't let fear live rent free on your mind and on your heart. But instead, be self-controlled. God has given you the power to control yourself. Control yourself by choosing. Today I am through rehearsing, uh, internalizing fear in my mind. But I choose to hear the word of God. I choose to give the word of God its pedestal on my mind. I choose To give the word of God. I want to share to you three vision. I don't know if we can call this vision or, you know, goals that we're hoping in 2023. In regards to this, the first thing is that our knowing will impact our standing. Because it says, the people who know the Lord. The people who know the Lord shall stand firm. David in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 to 2 says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and and meditates on his law day and night. You know, uh, my our prayer is that Our knowing this year, I mean, we all know God. We all know his word to certain degrees. But knowledge alone is not enough because even the devil knows about God. But I pray in the truest essence of Daniel 11.32b, the people who know, that word know there is the expression of the most intimate knowing of their of all knowing ever there is so it's not just i know uh i don't know any celebrities here i know uh, lebron james you know but lebron james don't know me but the word know there is a depiction of intimacy between two lovers so it's 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 the deepest degree of knowing ever my prayer is that this year will become the year that your knowing of God gets a major upgrade. It's not just going to church. It's not just a word Christian printed on your ID card. It's not just, you know, Christian tradition, Christmas tree on Christmas time. Really, 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 you you, you decide this year are you going to learn to know him in the same regards that he knows you? Because that's the essence of relationship. David says, blessed is the one who does not stand in the way that sinners take. You choose where you want to stand. I mean, the, standing, it means where you are positionally, and it also means The position that you choose to tell the whole world. This is where I stand. I like that word, that saying, that that word that says, if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. It's not biblical. I mean, it's, there's no verse, but I think it's, it's very true. What are you standing? I am wary at Christians who cower at the attack of modern culture where those who were wrong, you know, those who were so deceived in their, deceitful in their mind 
are more, uh, they're more bold than Christians who, who claim to have the truth. Nobody died for their beliefs. Jesus died for what we receive. And yet we cowered because we don't want to be labeled intolerant. We don't want to be rejected by the world, so we put Jesus aside. In the essence of a true relationship, you can only choose one. Where you can devote your whole everything. That's a true relationship. Hello? The second thing is that our knowing will impact our doing. Our knowing will impact our doing. I mean, there are those who know just for the sake of knowledge's sake, smarter, and some even get certified, get a piece of paper that certified your knowledge. But I'm not interested in that. This world is filled with doers, movers, history makers, who's not certified, but their knowledge is certified by their doing. I mean, I think this world offered a backward approach to us, get certified. So we pull our resources, give our best precious resources just to get certified. But after being certified, we have no clue how to put into application what we've just been certified. That's the failure of education. I'm not saying education is not important. But if everything we aim is that piece of paper that we will hang on our office or living room, don't go after knowledge for knowledge's sakes. But my prayer, the same way, with how we choose to learn the word of God, my prayer is that our decision, our desire to learn the word of God will lead to practical doing, will lead to immediate doing. Daniel chapter 3, verse 18, this is very powerful. Uh, if, if you ever read the whole passage, the context was these three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, which is also Daniel's uh, co-partner, was being, they were being, um, what do you call it? Uh, they were being held and getting ready to be executed because they refused to bow down to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. So I did not put the previous verse, but the previous verse says this. This is their, their own admission. This says, King, we know, we know that our God will rescue us. Wow. That's, I should put it in the screen, actually, because there's the word that we know that our, our God will rescue us. But even if he does not, we want you to know. Your majesty, still honorable, <laughs> still polite. We want you to know, your eminent, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. What they know, lead them to do the one good thing that ended up becoming the platform of God's glory. We all know the, pro the, the, the story after that in the furnace of fire. You know, three went in, but four was visible, one being the Son of God. You know, many of us, we like hearing testimony, but we hate being tested. But I want you to know that there will not be testimony if you always avoid being tested. Christians should be like fish. We should not fear Testing, trial, tribulation. Because just like fish, you know, water can be an, a, a drag, but also it's the very reason why they continue to swim away, continue to live, continue to thrive. Our victory is not in the middle of the world being peaceful, economy stable, no enemy. But our victory will be in the midst of fierce opposition, the world being in shambles, economy in chaos. So that God can say, not your doing, but my doing. But through you, your obedience, your faithfulness. Our prayer is that 
our knowing will impact our doing. So listen to this. The real danger wasn't just persecution, but rather compromise. Next slide. The real danger wasn't just persecution, but rather compromise. See, because the king, you know, we should not, most of us, we, we had it all backward. We fear being persecuted. But actually, what we need to be afraid more is that we stop being faithful to God. Persecution is a straight first class ticket to eternity. All expenses paid. But when you were allowed to deny God, leave Him, and continue to live in perversion, in the end, it will not be good for us. So what is at stake here is not just persecution. The world fear persecution. Most Christians fear persecution. But the book of Daniel, Daniel 11, verse 32 says, it was compromise that every Christian should be wary. It was compromise that we need to be watchful. We may be still alive, but we are living on the wrong trajectory of life that will lead us in the end, into judgment. Real danger wasn't just persecution, but rather compromise. The third vision is that our knowing will impact our living. Our knowing will impact our living. Our life will change. Matthew 16, 17, 18, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, you are, that on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You know, actually, I don't have time to go through this, but Matthew 16, 17, 18 is a very good parallel of Daniel as well, Daniel 11, 32. Uh, um, right there, Jesus asks the disciples, who do people say that I am? First, they ask what people say. And then they, Jesus delivered it home and asked them personally, for you, according to you, to you personally, who do you say that I am? And Peter managed to become the one <laughs> that gave the right answer at that time. And you say, blessed are you. It's not revealed to you. It's not your own saying, but revealed to you by my Father. But know this, Peter, that upon this rock, this is how I'm going to build my church. That the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. That the gates of hell will not be able to stop the kingdom of God. So if you read that word, let me ask you the simple question. When you read that word, your understanding, which one's moving and which one is not? The gates of hell or the kingdom of God? The ga I've never seen gates moving. <laughs> but Jesus was saying, because my church is built on this rock, on this conviction, on this conviction that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. On the conviction that you know the right God. You know the right knowledge about God. Then you will not be silent. You will not be passive. But instead, you will move forward to the point that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Who's afraid of who? Who's attacking who? If we get our knowledge right in the word of God, we as a believer, we've been long overdue. We should stand firm and take action. We should rise up. But instead, we've been having this bunker mentality and putting the culture and the world outside. Been so afraid. Who's supposed to be afraid of who? If we live our right knowledge when we are built on the rock, the world should be afraid of us. There's no place that we should be afraid of. If we are walking with the mission of God, if we're walking. Amen, church? So let me close with this. We do not win because God is on our side. But we win because we are on his side. Hello? Hello? I know there's a word that says, if God is for me, who can be against me? Context, people, context. Learn the context. Don't just quote one verse and then put it on a frame, but not understanding the context. 
But this is a more proper context. We do not win because God is at our disposal. God is like the weapon that sidearm, sideshow, side attraction. We only pull him when we need him. Which really degrades who he is. No, whose agenda is being served? It's his agenda. We do not win because God is on our side. But we will win if we are on his side. If we are doing his agenda. So I, I mean, yes, sure, there's no guarantee you will always win. But if you are on his side, I can guarantee you his word will never fail. His word will never fail. His kingdom will never fail. So whose kingdom are you serving right now? Daniel 11.32, he shall seduce with flattery this, those who violate the covenant. But the people who know their God will stand firm and take action. The world is not any worse than it already was. Our enemy is not any fiercer than they already were back then. People of the Lord did not suffer any more now than they already were then. Still the same enemies. Still the same faithful God. Still serving the same faithful call. That is yes and amen. So my prayer, our prayer, we pray that this year will be a year where the church will rise up. That you are going to know him and stand firm and take action. Amen, church. Let's pray. Can I have all the music team to come? <clears throat> Can we sing that song again, Same God? Because I know that's the anthem that we need to be reminding ourselves. Would you all stand with me? <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Come on, let's sing it. Oh, God, my God. Oh, God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God, I need you. How I need you now Oh rock, oh rock of ages I'm standing on your faithfulness On your faithfulness Oh God, my God, I need you Oh God, my God, I need you how I need you now Oh rock, oh rock of ages I'm standing on your faithfulness On your faithfulness You're the same God You're the same God, Lord Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that your word will continue to be planted deep in the heart of every believer in this place. My prayer, oh God, is that this year will be a year that your people will learn to know you even more. Hosea has a cry out to the people of the Lord. He say, let us try to know God. Let us strive to know God. Let us strive to really know God. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that this word will forever be an echo, forever be a reminder in the heart of every believer. Not just knowing for knowledge's sake, not just knowing for just an info, but let this year be the year that we start building a serious relationship with you. That our knowing start impacting our standing. That our knowing start impacting our doing. That our knowing start impacting our living. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you begin to bring conviction down into the heart of every believer in this place. Our economy today is not any worse than 
it worse during Daniel time. Our enemy today is are not more fierce, are, are not fiercer than Daniel's time. The instability, the persecution, the hostilities that we are experiencing today is not worse than they were at Daniel's time. It's all about timing, Lord. And we know that we're living right at the end times. But this is good news. Just like Paul says, that the door of opportunity are opening wide despite adversity. But Lord, we know, God, that we will be triumphant and your people will stand firm and take action, oh God. I pray, oh God, that you strengthen every knees, every hands, everybody, every believer in this place. I pray, oh God, those who are trembling in their heart will be transformed. Lord, I pray, oh God, that the victories we're going to cause is, is, is going to be great, oh God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your people will draw near to you as you will draw near to them, oh God. I pray, Lord, that faith will arise in this place. That courage will mount up. Courage will dominate, oh God. And fear will be evicted from within our heart, from within every family, from within this gathering, oh God. That hope will triumph, oh God. That even in the midst of this darkness, oh God, this present darkness, that your hope will cause your people, oh God, to be victorious. We declare this, O oh God, your kingdom come, your will be done. Honored as it is in heaven, in our life as it is in heaven. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.